What's up, everyone? This is Anthony Pompliano. Most of you know me as Pomp. You're listening to Off the Chain, simply the best podcast in crypto. Let's kick this thing off. Trace Meyer is a true Bitcoin OG. He was buying Bitcoin in 2011 and is the hodler of last resort. In this conversation, we discuss the early days of Bitcoin, how Trace built his initial conviction, where the asset is today, what Trace thinks are the most important things to watch, and where we are headed next. This is a can't-miss episode, so I highly recommend listening. Skirt, skirt! Want to know who has the best URL? Crypto.com. That's right, Crypto.com. They're a crypto platform with one goal, mother mass adoption. That's why we're all here. We're trying to get crypto in every wallet. Crypto.com is helping people do that through buying, earning, lending, and card payment. Everything you could want at Crypto.com. Go help your boy out. Tell him Pomp sent you. Download the app or visit Crypto.com. Pomp's got you. Always. Ever wanted to get into mining and didn't know how? Don't worry. Your boy Pomp's got you. Everybody got some electricity and Wi-Fi. All you got to do is go to CoinMine.com. You buy a coin mine. It's like an Xbox or a PlayStation that helps you turn your electricity into Bitcoin. That's right. You purchase it. It shows up at your doorstep. You pull it out of the box. You plug it in. Connect to your Wi-Fi. Five minutes or less, you're mining Bitcoin. All you have to do is control it from the mobile app they provide. And then you receive over-the-air updates that add new coins and new features on a consistent basis. Kind of like how Tesla does over-the-air updates and updates the car software. Just you're updating your coin mine. Consumer mining made easy. That's right. Go to coinmine.com. Tell them Pomp sent you and thank me later. As many of you know, crypto investors store their digital assets on exchanges or in cold storage for long-term safekeeping. However, this strategy doesn't help them grow their investment holdings or build overall wealth. With the new BlockFi interest account, users can now securely store their Bitcoin or Ether at BlockFi and receive 6% annual interest paid monthly in cryptocurrency. 6% is an absurdly high rate. It's the best rate in the industry. I highly suggest you go check out BlockFi.com slash POMP. Again, that's BlockFi.com slash POMP to sign up and start earning crypto today. If you follow Bitcoin and crypto, you've probably heard of eToro. They're the world's number one social trading platform, and I love it. They've got more than 10 million other traders that love it too. And guess what? They just launched in the United States. eToro offers access to the world's most popular cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, and others. With the smartest trading tools and the ability to connect with the best traders around the world, there's no better place to build your perfect portfolio. If you're new to Bitcoin and crypto, you can test the waters with their $100,000 virtual trading feature. But if you're more experienced, you can create custom technical charts and use eToro's social feeds to inform your trading decisions. They've got transparent fees, and so you never miss out. They also have an easy-to-use application available on iPhone, Android, or any web browser. You can get started today in just a few clicks at eToro.com. Again, that's eToro.com. Get VIP access to Bitcoin and crypto markets today. Anthony Pompliano is a partner at Morgan Creek Digital. All opinions expressed by Pomp or his guests on this podcast are solely their opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Morgan Creek Digital or Morgan Creek Capital Management. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Pomp as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of his opinion. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All right, guys, bang, bang. I'm here with uh, probably one of the people I've most looked forward to uh, to having you guys listen to, uh, Mr. Trace Meyer. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> so Trace and I have talked a ton, um, and uh, he's got a bunch of uh, really powerful ideas and just been around um, the Bitcoin space for a long time. So let's start from day one. Uh, what were you doing before you ever heard of Bitcoin? Yeah, so I had uh, written a paper on money and currency in American law in law school. So a very deep, like, a- academic paper. So I got a good philosophical foundation. Then I started reading uh, Mises and Rothbard and Dr. Vieira, um, you know, all this type of stuff. So I got a good foundation in Austrian economics. Uh, then I took a course in Mises Academy on network effects in the digital age. This was before Bitcoin even came out. <laughs> You know, so I mean, it, people are like, oh, people, people just got lucky, like buying Bitcoin. It's like, 
No, man. No. <laughs> like, you, didn't, you, you didn't just get lucky like buying Bitcoin, and you definitely didn't get lucky hodling it, yeah. right? Well, I always say that uh, there's some people who got lucky in the sense that they were you know, early in video gaming or they were doing nefarious things, like, and they were just looking for a currency, right. and then they usually forgot they had it, and then it ended up being Or they spent it. Or they spent it. You specifically were focused on money. You saw it. Right? We'll get into kind of how you saw it and what you did, but – you not only have held, but you've continued to buy, oh, right? Yeah. And so the conviction level uh, is off the charts, right? Oh, yeah, for me, I mean, like I, I coined the term on uh, on Pierre's podcast, uh, noted uh, hodler of last resort, yeah. man. Like for real, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's me. So, so uh, all right, so you're studying kind of money, economics, finance, etc. And, and then when do you first? Uh, well, let's yeah, talk about well, the gold. When I've been in digital currency uh, in the in the mid '90s, you know, in high school and mid late '90s, and I played with, played around with e gold, mm-hmm. played around with encryption, played around with uh, Napster and Kazaa and LimeWire and like all. So I mean, like just this confluence of all these things, I developed the human capital. Mm-hmm. You know, the most important thing you can do is invest in yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, what's the return going to be on that? Mm-hmm. Like, education is the key to opportunity. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, you know, they they just don't invest in themselves. They don't have that time preference. They don't have the curiosity. And so, you know, luck is when that preparation meets opportunity. And so I had done that, you know, I, instead of dinking around, like watching TV, like I was reading Mises. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I didn't get lucky, Mm -hmm. like people in this, and, and especially having the conviction to huddle, you know, like I didn't get shaked out by yep. like Jihan and his Bcash like thing. I mean, I just swiped a bunch of his bitcoins. Yep, like lots of them. Yep. <laughs> and so, you know, this is this is how this game is played. We're at war, taking territory on the Bitcoin blockchain, mm-hmm. measured in satoshis. Mm-hmm. And, and so, as you were uh, doing the self study, really educating yourself uh, both on technology and then on money and finance. Um, there was a point in time where uh, you were one of the probably more prominent voices around gold. Right. Oh, yeah. Maybe talk a little bit about what you were doing there and kind of what the thesis was. Yeah. So because I'd written that paper, I'd always been interested in the money, and then I like learned the philosoph- the philosophy behind sound money and and its role in politics and political philosophy and everything. And and that whole time, I mean, I was trading. I was trading. You know, I, mm-hmm. I was trading stocks in in high school, and and I was trading derivatives in uh, college and law school. You know, I'm trading futures and I'm trading like puts and calls and. I mean, freaking crushed it on the Google IPO because I bought calls and then it like did the S curve and I like layered in on the calls. And so like those, I mean, I, I made like 120 X on my Google <laughs> investment in six weeks, you know, because I played the derivatives, right? Yep. And, and I really like the derivatives because you can, you can like with laser precision, like hedge out your different risk. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I was very sophisticated in a lot of this stuff. And then, then I ran into GATA. Uh, and and Dr. Vieira went and had breakfast with him at the GATA conference in D.C. And, you know, if you're not familiar with the gold price suppression scheme and the work of GATA, GATA.org, uh, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, you just don't understand how the world works. Like, I mean, you, you just don't. You just and don't what's the it. website? GATA? GATA, G-A-T-A dot org. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, because the central banks, they, they hold gold in the vault and gold out on loan as the same line item. They're reporting cash accounts receivable as the same thing. We're talking about something that, you, that they can't print. Uh, th- they only have a half to a third of the physical gold they claim to have that, based on forensic accounting of their, ba- of their financial statements. And this was in the mid-2000s. Mm-hmm. Uh, Which and, probably has gotten worse and it, Yeah, it's gotten worse. Some central banks are starting to buy more gold now. But, I mean, gold's the locus of, of the financial world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I mean, like, and they want to – it's very odd. If you own a lot of something, why run a cartel to – to suppress the price. Mm-hmm. And it's because the price of, of a portfolio asset is irrelevant compared to your power to issue what we use as currency. Yep. And so, you know, they're propping up their fiat paper franchises. And it, I mean, it's just, uh, so, so, so that whole area was, was huge, you know? And, and so I'd, I'd started run to gold, uh, in 2008. What written, was that? Uh, run to gold.com, just a blog. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd write about monetary and economic stuff. And then, uh, the first week of, 2009, I published my book, The Great Credit Contraction, asserted that it had started. Mm -hmm. So we'd spent 500 years going from commodity money and fractional reserve banking, uh, commodity money and full reserve banking to fractional reserve banking and and fiat currencies Mm -hmm. uh, over a a great credit expansion, 500 years. And, 
you know, now it's kind of reached its zenith in economic law. It's going to come back down. Mm -hmm. Capital burrowed down the liquidity pyramid into safer, more liquid assets, which is exactly what we saw happen. You know, and part of the reason why I think interest rates are where they're at. This is where I differ with Peter Schiff. You know, oh, hyperinflation. It's like, no, no, no. Capital is going to all burrow into treasuries because those are safe and liquid. Mm -hmm. And then they'll eventually evaporate into nothing through hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's going to be down the road. And only when the capital moves from them to something lower in the pyramid which will be gold and silver mm -hmm. at the time when I publish the book, or increasingly it looks like it's going to become Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Bitcoin was a very natural fit into my thesis on the Great Credit Contraction. Uh, coincidentally, you know, I give an example in the book uh, where somebody's like uh, extinguishing a, a, a debt or a trade and using silver coin to buy pizza, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is, you know, we, we have the famous pizza transaction, yep. which happened with someone in my, uh, in my, in my city I grew up in. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. I love it. You know, just fun how all these things, uh, oh yeah, you know, it's just by coincidence. Um, yeah. So anyways, I published that book the same week Bitcoin came out. So the great credit contraction has started. Uh, we had all the craziness of 08, 09. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I also started my podcast uh, that same week, 2009, Run to Gold podcast. At you the were time. early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> early I mean, to the podcast. Yeah, game. early to pretty much everything, right? And uh, yeah, and so that's kind of where it's at. So then, uh, you know, I let Bitcoin, I, I learned about it and then, uh, and then, you know, of course, like let it germinate a little mm -hmm. bit more. And then January of 2011, mm -hmm. you know, at about a quarter, that's when I started first publicly talking about it mm -hmm. um, and, and was the first pop popular blogger, you know, someone mm -hmm. who had millions of people, that, millions of page views and stuff like that. Um, first person to really talk about it. I mean, otherwise it's very obscure. And then Roger Ver, uh, he came in and started talking about it a couple months later. Uh, and then, you know, everything's kind of off and running to, from there. To describe how early you are, uh, if you asked uh, Safe Dean who wrote the Bitcoin Standard, you are where he learned about Bitcoin first, right? It just these oh, people yeah. who were interested in Austrian economics, gold, et cetera, they were learning from you when you were writing about it. Yeah, so – and I specifically targeted mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I, I, I was thinking about this. It's like, okay – if this really plays out and we have this wealth transfer, the likes of which the world's never seen, which is going to be huge, once in a species opportunity, triple entry bookkeeping, uh, sound as hard as money, who do I want to have be the benefits of that? Mm -hmm. You know, be, be the benefits of, of that wealth transfer. And I'm like, well, I like the gold bugs because they should understand money. Mm -hmm. uh, and the libertarians, because they're just crazy. And, mm -hmm. and what would the world look like if a bunch of libertarians were ultra rich? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. It would be crazy, right? Like, mm -hmm. like that's going to change the political constitution of the, the makeup of the world. So th those are the two niches that I, I went out and started targeting. And sure enough, you know, some of them latched onto it. Some of them didn't. It was interesting, you know, like Lou Rockwell, he just was not interested in Bitcoin at all. Mm -hmm. um, Peter Schiff, you know, <laughs> Bitcoin's... Bitcoin's eight dollars, and we're at a we're in an investment conference in Palm Springs. We have all the interview equipment out because I just finished it uh, with the Future Money Trends guys. Peter Schiff walks by. I knew him from Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. and they're like, we start having a conversation, and they're like, hey, why don't we why don't we put this on, uh, like record it and put it up on YouTube? And Peter Schiff's like, you know, weaseling his way out of it, and he finally makes the statement. He's like, no, I don't want to because you'll make me look stupid. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, so it's not about the audience and what's best for them. It's about whether you're going to keep making fees off of them, yep. right? Yeah, yeah. So I lost a little bit of respect for him because for the most part, I mean, I've given all my work away for free. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I charged for my book when it first came out, but now it's free. I give everything away for free. I don't have any ads in my podcast or anything like that. It's like, you know, I I like to think of myself as kind of the clarion call warning people, mm -hmm. you know, and. And that, that was good for the first decade. Bitcoin's out there. It's not going away, not going anywhere. And so, so now we get to be a little bit more competitive yeah. uh, in this next decade. Well, well so one of the things that uh, you've told me previously that uh, fascinates me is when you first started writing about it, it was somewhat from a bent of like, oh, we may have missed this, right? Even though it was still, what, a uh, dollar, $5? I don't know what the price was. But it, it had gone from you know three tenths of a penny to whatever it like was, thirty bucks to thirty bucks, crashed to two dollars. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there was an, a sense that early in the community of like, oh, you know, we all just missed this huge run from a penny to thirty dollars. Yeah, I mean, 
I, I didn't, not that we missed it, it's just we missed that particular run mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we're going to have these massive uh, volatility, these massive types of runs because, man, people are just, it's like the dog on LSD, mm -hmm. like chasing the rabbit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, I mean that, and, and there's no punch protection team to like mm -hmm. moderate these prices. Mm -hmm. And and if the punch protection team tries to, they're going to get wrecked yeah. because yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Ca they can't deliver fake Bitcoins. Yep. <laughs> so yep. like the thing that keeps <laughs> the traditional market stabilized is not available here and therefore you get the volatility. But we've been trained, I think, uh, and educated that the volatility is bad and that the markets are bad when they're hyper volatile. But actually, it's a very natural thing. What's yeah. Happening. No, it's, it's it's actually a wonderful process of price discovery and, and allocating the the, the, the the different resources. And Mises even writes about this in Human Action, the evenly rotating economy, and just <laughs> that's a fool's iron to try and mm -hmm. uh, try and make work. So you know, people who want to seek safety and security and all this stuff, like you no, know, we're going in, we're sailing into a new world yep. where uh, we're going to have a much more. Uh, volat there's just going to be a lot more volatility yeah. because we can't moderate the prices. Punch mm -hmm. protection team's not going to be able to handle it. Mm -hmm. not, where are they going to get the resources? Mm -hmm. w walk me through what the thesis on Bitcoin is today, right? In terms of, so we've had it a decade. It's not going anywhere. Everything you've said so far, you know, I, I pretty much agree with. Um, how do you look at Bitcoin given the rest of the macro economy, uh, some of the issues that we're seeing as warning signs in the uh, legacy system, and then where that asset is today and how it kind of can play out over the next few years. Yeah, I mean, we're building the we're, we're building the replacement. Bitcoin's the lifeboat. Uh, the current system is burning. Like, how long are you going to stay on it? Mm -hmm. uh, the losses are going to have to get realized by somebody mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. real. Like, uh, you know... <laughs> There's no way to avoid the final crack of boom, and we have so much that's been hypothecated and rehypothecated. They're they're the real and productive assets in the economy, and the combined per, like productive ability of the economy just doesn't justify all the debt that's out there. Now we got negative yielding debt, so like the current system is totally foobard, and Bitcoin looks to be the solution. Why? Uh, you know, Plan B uh, with his modeling Bitcoin scarcity and then the co-integration that uh, helps prove that model. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that's very important. So now we're like if you're managing large amounts of assets, you have to, like you're totally negligent if you aren't seriously considering Bitcoin in part of the portfolio. So I, I started saying this um, probably last year, so 2018, where uh, it was more so when my partners and I go in to go talk to these institutions, there's a tipping point, right? And and I wasn't so much claiming like we were at the tipping point as much as we were getting close to the tipping point of if Bitcoin has data that shows it's a non-correlated asymmetric asset and we understand how in putting that into a portfolio with modern portfolio theory, it has a positive impact on the portfolio and you're aware of that and you don't do it, there is an element of you're actually violating your fiduciary Why duty. Why didn't you do it? But, well, that's where the questions come, right? You is, know, like for real, like why didn't you do it? Why'd you why, why'd you miss out on this? Exactly, and, and I think at first, you know, uh, Mark Yusko, uh, my partner who's been in the asset management business, you know, 25, 30 years now, saying something like that is very um, kind of hyperbole, right? And and just it was a little uncomfortable. And then as I started thinking more and more about it, now he's like, no, 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 actually, there's a lot of validity in that because. The data is the data, right? What what it yeah. promises to do is exactly what yeah, those I mean, institutional investors are supposed to be looking. I for. mean, look at Bitcoin sharp ratio. Mm -hmm. Look at like what it it's uncorrelated. Look at Plan B's work. You know, mm -hmm. where where you're able to model out with ninety nine point five percent correlation the Bitcoin price based on stock to flow mm -hmm. in days, mm -hmm. and then you're able to prove that with co integration. Mm -hmm. So uh, walk us through stock to flow. What is it, and kind of how that worked? The work you did, and then what yeah, Plan B's doing. Yeah, so I mean, because I came out of gold, you know, and and trying to value gold, especially with all this central bank interference, uh, I, I honed in on stock to flow very early. And, you know, I think there are even tweets where where I put out about Bitcoin stock to flow mm -hmm. in like 2014 and 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and so then Safety and like wrote the Bitcoin standard was just totally the book I would write if I weren't lazy. <laughs> like mm -hmm. he did an excellent job with that book. And, mm -hmm. and I just can't praise him enough on that. Uh, part of the reason I did a legendary series with him on my Bitcoin Knowledge podcast, five episodes, I highly recommend people will listen to those, uh, along with the series I did with Adam Back. Um, and so, you know, the, we, we got that. And then, what was it, like six months ago or something, Plan B came out with this. 
And Plan uh, B is somebody on Twitter. With yeah, the, with anonymous guy on, yeah. on Twitter uh, supposedly works at a quant fund or something. But he took what I felt intuitively mm-hmm. when looking at the Bitcoin thesis, you know, because I also came up with the seven network effects of Bitcoin. Speculation, merchants, consumers, miners or security, developers, and I put in there like accountants, attorneys, regulators, uh, financialization, mm-hmm. things like backed, ledger X, mm-hmm. futures, options. Um, and then world reserve settlement currency. So that's the destiny or the potential destiny. And it's like what, you know, and, and their entire industries and then companies within those industries within each of those network effects. And they all exponentially reinforce each other. The network effects do, you know, and because I've taken that Mises Academy course on network effects, like before Bitcoin even came out and network effects in the digital age, I was like, oh, my gosh, like Bitcoin's going to have all these network effects and blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, I just really honed in on Bitcoin and like, man, this could be a solution to the great credit contraction. Like, mm-hmm. where do you run for protection mm-hmm. of, of your standard of living? Because mm-hmm. it's going to be much more about just protecting yep. the capital you've got or, or think you've got because – a huge amount of that liquidity pyramid has to evaporate into nothing because it never existed in the first place. Yeah, we, we, we've talked to almost ad nauseum at this point on the podcast about how inflation uh, creates a wealth inequality gap, how it eats away at the actual uh, wealth somebody has. It steals the wealth, it inflates assets, it uh, enriches the elite, etc. Um, and, and, and most importantly, I'd say it distorts it, – it's a form of economic censorship. Mm-hmm. And what this gold price suppression scheme has done is it's effectively censored interest rates, mm-hmm. which are a vital – a mechanism to allocate resources in the economy and over time. Mm-hmm. And so, like, if Bitcoin really is censorship resistant, it's going to be able to withstand economic censorship, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is going – and when that happens, now we no longer have a centrally planned global economy using fiat currencies mm-hmm. and fractional reserve banking to carry out political means, mm-hmm. deciding who gets different capital and who doesn't, mm-hmm. right? And so all of this – you know, all of this, I intuitively felt – all of this and, and even could articulate it and you go back and look at some of my early interviews and stuff, you know, and I did a pretty good job with it, you know, for six, seven, eight years ago. But, you know, it was still very intuitive for me. But mm-hmm. plan B has just logically laid out and done a lot of the math on this stock to flow. And it's like, oh, my it's gosh. scary how accurate it's it is. It's freak. It's not just scary. It's it's so scary that he said you could go back and use only the data up through like mid-2011 and still come out with the same model. Mm-hmm. So it's been sitting there in for everybody to discover, mm-hmm. right? And then like Black Shoals, I was listening to one of his podcasts and he's talking about Black Shoals. The guys – it was out there publicly available for a decade before like portfolio managers decided to start using it. Mm-hmm. And so it was exploitable for that whole time. And he's like, the same thing's happening with Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. So I think the first decade was, you know, we're, we're all still kind of stumbling in the fog, like try, mm-hmm. trying to figure out what to do with this thing. You know, and I was, you know, waving a hot or last resort, like just buy this stuff and hold it mm-hmm. and hold your own keys and don't put them on Mount Gox and blah, blah. I didn't lose a single Satoshi on Mount Gox, mm-hmm. like, because I'm just not what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Proof of Keys, right? Proofofkeys.com. <laughs> I guess it's coming January 3rd. You imagine global coordinated bank run on an asset that's strictly limited in amount that everybody can verify with a full node that they can run on a Raspberry Pi? It's crazy. Like, and we're going to do this every year, this mm-hmm. Proof of Keys? Mm-hmm. You know, and, they, and these banks think they have a problem in the repo market right now? Mm-hmm. I mean, just wait. All right, you so on, on the stock to flow <laughs> stuff, the accuracy is really, really scary, but describe... And, and it's got... Co- and it's been proven on the co-integration. So yeah. they so explain what that means. So so okay, it's highly correlated. Mm-hmm. So what? It could be a spurious correlation, mm-hmm. you know, and and we've seen all different types of charts like, you know, the butterfly flaps its wing in Tokyo and you have an earthquake in California and, and it happened at the same time and yep. and therefore it's correlated. Yep. Right? It happened three times. It happened three <laughs> times, therefore it's correlated. We got ourselves a trend. Uh, so you can have spurious correlation. So so in a, in econometrics and I don't really agree, you know, I I I'm, I'm much more like a fundamental uh, in terms of like the Austrian economic theory, but I think there's a lot that we can learn from the math, mm-hmm. and and I and I don't think we should run away from the math if it's hard to do. Um, so you know, I, I like to first make sense of it in terms of the, the the philosophy and the logical argument, 
And then I like to apply the best tools I can, mm-hmm. you know, whether that's mayor multiple or, uh, the, you know, econometrics or whatever. Anyways, so they, they looked at the co-integration and, they, and, and tried to falsify the hypothesis mm-hmm. to say it's a spurious correlation. And actually, it's co-integrated. Mm-hmm. So that means that it's not a spurious correlation, mm-hmm. that it actually is this way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so now, now, like, portfolio managers are going to have to look at this and be like, oh, my gosh. Like, so we're looking at a, at a six-figure Bitcoin price in 2021. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the stock to flow is going to change in the number of days. Yep, and 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 we know we know what the stock to flow is going to be because of the difficulty adjustment algorithm, and we know how many days there are going to be, and mm-hmm. those are the only v- variables that are determining our price. Yeah, well, and the thing that's interesting to me is uh, that's all with uh, the value, right? So the way that I think of the value, well, price, right? Well, I mean, value is subjective. Yeah, the the well, value meaning um, that is what if without human uh, excess and greed, right? This is where the price is going to go. What I think you see though is uh, in the euphoria when you go from ten to twenty thousand dollar price points, and that's your mayor multiple, right? Exactly. So explain explain what the mayor multiple is. And yeah. How it works. So first, I didn't coin it. I'm not. Oh, really? I'm not. That way, no. But okay. Pres- Preston Pish from oh, yeah, Bitcoin yeah. Investors podcast like coined it. Okay, and and then everybody's like, oh, more math because like, <laughs> Bitcoiners love to do math, right? <laughs> we, we, we got some skills there. So so basically, I ran into the the problem that I figured was, you know, with the gold price suppression scheme is if they're economically censoring the the pricing mechanism, like how am I going to determine whether something's actually a good value or not? Mm-hmm. How am I going to do my economic calculation? Because they're like screwing with the thing that I'm using as a unit of account. And then it's like, oh, I'll just like – I'll put it in the numerator and the denominator and then I'll cancel it out. Mm-hmm. So I take the current price and the 200-day moving average and that gives me – and then I get to cancel out the dollar signs, right? Mm-hmm. And I actually did an interview with Anthem Blanchard because mm-hmm. uh, his father helped get gold Big re-legalized. Gold. And, and you know, Blanchard, Blanchard & Company mm-hmm. uh, founded it. Uh, but and we talked about this, you know, it's kind of a secret decoder ring where you can cancel out the dollar sign uh, in the equation, and so that that gives me a relative price, you know. And so if we have ten thousand dollar Bitcoin today, and the two hundred day moving average is eighty two hundred, then we have like a one point two mayor mm-hmm. multiple. Well, you can take that that relative price and you can look at it over time, and look at standard deviations. And so you can be like, okay, like if it's over two point seven, then it's expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, relative, mm-hmm. right? And if it's under like 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.7 or 0. 0.8, really, then it's cheap. Mm-hmm. And you know, if and in gonna, between is what? And in between is kind of fairly valued, okay. you know. And yep. you, and and I like to look at like one, two, and three standard deviations mm-hmm. on both sides and create bands. And and so you know, good example of practically applying this because you know I've started trading the derivatives. So in December of 2018. You know, Bitcoin's at what four thousand uh, dollars? Probably lower than that, yeah. And and volatility was kind of low. Mm-hmm. Vol was low, and so on Ledger X. Guess what I did? What I bought seventy seven June twenty twenty five k calls at between eleven hundred and fifteen hundred dollars a piece. Skirt skirt. Want to know who has the best URL? Crypto dot com. That's right, crypto dot com. They're a crypto platform with one goal: mother f- mass adoption. That's why we're all here. We're trying to get crypto in every wallet. Crypto.com is helping people do that through buying, earning, lending, and card payment. Everything you could want at Crypto.com. Go help your boy out. Tell him Pomp sent you. Download the app or visit Crypto.com. Pomp's got you always. Ever wanted to get into mining and didn't know how? Don't worry. Your boy Pomp's got you. Everybody got some electricity and Wi-Fi. All you got to do is go to coinmine.com. You buy a coin mine. It's like an Xbox or a PlayStation that helps you turn your electricity into Bitcoin. That's right. You purchase it. It shows up at your doorstep. You pull it out of the box. You plug it in, connect to your Wi-Fi. Five minutes or less, you're mining Bitcoin. All you have to do is control it from the mobile app they provide. And then you receive over the air updates that add new coins and new features on a consistent basis. Kind of like how Tesla does over the air updates and updates the car software. Just you're updating your coin mine. Consumer mining made easy. That's right. Go to coinmine.com. Tell them Pomp set you and thank me later. One more word from our sponsor, BlockFi. Their new interest account allows you to securely deposit your Bitcoin or Ether at BlockFi and receive 6% annual interest paid monthly in cryptocurrency. 
this rate actually compounds. So you receive a 6.2% APY, which is very attractive given the alternatives. So you can actually take your Bitcoin, you can deposit it with BlockFi and get paid an interest rate of 6% in return. Go check out BlockFi.com slash POMP. Again, BlockFi.com slash POMP to sign up and start earning interest on your crypto today. Wait, wait, hold on. You bought 77 calls for June 2020, so basically a year and a half out. 18 months out. Yep. At like $5,000. Five, five K strikes. Yep. And I paid between 1100 and 1500 uh, premium. <laughs> How's that going to turn out? Well, they're already $5,500 <laughs> in the money. <laughs> and I still got like eight months left. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was like, oh, you know, like... Oh, this is going to be after the happening, and so basically, I'm up 3.7x in Bitcoin based on the capital that I deployed. Mm-hmm. Uh, on top of the price appreciation of Bitcoin, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Measured yeah. in Bitcoin, yep. the, 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 these options, the, the the options are now worth 3.7x in Bitcoin of mm-hmm. what I paid for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I, so I'm actually generating significant alpha versus yep. just holding Bitcoin itself. Yep, for right? sure. Right, and 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 that's before I ran into Plan B stuff. Yep, you know, so like you take Plan B and stock to flow, and you take Mayor Multiple because Mayor Multiple was very low. It was at like a point seven, mm-hmm. right? When I when I bought these call options, mm-hmm. and then Vol was low, mm-hmm. so I'm not paying very much for the volatility premium. I get a really long time premium, mm-hmm. and then like I have a strike that's one k out of the money. Mm-hmm. You know, when when which you know, if you're looking, if if you're at a 0.7 mayor multiple, you're at 4K, and the 200-day moving average is at like 5,500, mm-hmm. and you're kind of at the bottom of the bear market. You know, because you've looked at like these four-year cycles and everything. Yep. You're like, how much lower can this thing go? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like probably not much over the next 18 months, especially with a happening thrown in there. Mm-hmm. And so, boom, you know, bought those things. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll probably who knows how much I'll make on those things if yeah. we if we have 55K Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Whew, Holy cow! That 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 fifteen hundred dollar premium is going to turn into like fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, it's right? pretty crazy. <laughs> well, so so let's talk a little bit about the structural issues in the uh, legacy system right now. Obviously, uh, yeah, we're, repo market. Yeah, we're recording this right now while uh, there there was a. Um, uh, a liquidity crisis driven by withdrawals, I think, is the uh, is the way that it's being described. Tax payments. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, <laughs> uh, you and I probably think of it differently. Maybe just describe kind of your assessment as to what's happened and transpired, how they're trying to fix it, and what the issues are with that. Yeah. So basically, like center your banking banking system, you got the neck you get next day repos, mm-hmm. right? Like it's overnight cash, mm-hmm. and <laughs> some some banks. Are paying ten percent interest for overnight cash? Mm-hmm. Like this is this is crazy. Like why why are you? Well, you're so leveraged and in such a bad position that you got to pay ten percent interest mm-hmm. to like not go bankrupt, I guess, or whatever. Yeah. And, and um, we really don't have any transparency into what's yeah, going on. Yeah, but, I'd sure like to know who it is. Yeah, so I can short them. <laughs> yeah, and, and and really, it's if you know that they're paying ten percent on the uh, on the money that they're borrowing overnight, you know that it's got to be really, really bad because that's such an egregious interest rate. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's huge. And it's like, I mean, this is just overnight money, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, I think, and and so it's like 50, is like $53 billion that the Fed stepped in to like goose the system with. And, yeah. But that wasn't enough. That was the, that was the first. Day. Yeah, that was the first yeah. one. It got oversubscribed. And, and they're not cumulative because it's overnight, right? But then the Fed's like, oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll auction $75 billion. Mm-hmm. And there was $80 billion of bids. Mm-hmm. So $5 billion of, of shortfall didn't get funded. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, what you're basically saying is so first day, $53 billion, second day, $75 billion. Yeah, and then they but did the 75 people, the next day. Yeah, the but, next day. but on Wednesday, uh, the second day of the, um, the facility or the, or the overnight cash, basically there was $80 billion of need, only $75 billion was actually funded. there and so that five billion dollar uh delta is not a good sign well yeah that means somebody somebody needed five billion dollars mm-hmm. of overnight cash and didn't get it mm-hmm. and so what's the and impact, I'd like to what's know the impact of that well who is it mm-hmm. like why don't we start naming some names on who didn't get their didn't get their <laughs> bids in the in the in the emergency line of credit basically from the <laughs> fed right and so you know the 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 implications of this are look at toys r us Mm-hmm. You know, great example. They 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 were hobbling along, and then the creditors yanked their line of credit, and immediately they're in they're in bankruptcy. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what happens. Like cash cash is king. Mm-hmm. Like you need that liquidity. 
safety and liquidity, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, and so you, what, what's the number one killer of, of businesses? The number one killer is cash flow. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily that you have a profitable or unprofitable business, it's that you mismatch your, mismatch your cash flows. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you know, when I did my accounting degree, my absolute favorite financial statement was the cash flow statement. Mm-hmm. You know, because like, that's what matters, you know? It's like, where, tells you everything you need like, to. Tells you everything, you need, how healthy the company is. And you know, how much cash is it? Is it generating? and able to throw off and stuff like that or or is it using a bunch of it and so i think that this is you know that what's happening in the repo markets is just very you know because what, what happens when the banks don't have enough cash well they they need to start cutting lines of credit mm-hmm. so that so that they can they can call that cash in mm-hmm. and so that's a source of cash instead of a use of cash for mm-hmm. them you know so so they they start raining in on credit that's been extended to everybody and next thing you know like the the company that's living paycheck to paycheck doesn't have doesn't have a line of credit anymore Mm -hmm. and they go into bankruptcy Mm -hmm. and and then it starts getting fun because we have counterparty risk Mm -hmm. counterparty risk being uh, that's where you're reliant on the financial ability of the counterparty to perform Mm -hmm. and so you know what happens when you when you've written like a a massive uh, derivative Mm -hmm. and the counterparty fails Mm -hmm. well now the I think it what is it the the nominal becomes notional (laughs) (laughs) which which, and Warren Buffett described them as financial weapons of mass destruction, and so they start blowing holes in people's balance sheets. Mm-hmm. And and how how are the derivatives accounted for? Well, to get the bonuses, you 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 undervalue the liabilities and you overvalue the assets. Mm-hmm. You know, so we have a mismatch in the valuation of the derivatives on all on, on everybody's balance sheets also. So I think that might be playing. Uh, a role in this because it's like, well, I don't want to win that bank mm-hmm. the five billion dollars that they need because, like. I don't trust how they're valuing their assets. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and, and, and I guess part of this is, um, you know, people will say, okay, let's agree that everything you're saying is correct in the legacy financial system. How does Bitcoin fix this, right? The, the kind of one of these new memes is that there is a plan B, right? Or that yeah. Bitcoin does fix this. How do you think about that uh, either transition or that solution entering um, uh, kind yeah. of the financial world? Well, I mean, what's so beautiful about gold mm-hmm. and Bitcoin is that they are equity based. Mm-hmm. They are nobody's liability. Mm-hmm. They are sovereign wealth, mm-hmm. right? So like, you, you don't you don't have to have a line of credit with anybody. You don't you, you completely eliminate counterparty risk. Mm-hmm. So, you know that's nice that that X Y Z bank needs five billion dollars, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to give it to them, mm-hmm. and I don't care if they fail. Mm-hmm. Let them fail. Yep. And and so now you know for for whole, for hodlers of Bitcoin, you know we we actually benefit from the collapse of all of these institutions. Mm-hmm. We want them to fail. Mm-hmm. We don't want them to get bailed out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you think about the uh, ethical implications in terms of the people who get hurt if that happens? Well, you know, Bitcoin's been around for a decade. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been on all the major news stuff. Like, what you doing? Being greedy? Like trying to get a get a higher return by having money in this over leveraged bank? That mm-hmm. like, why were you doing that? Mm-hmm. You know, why why didn't you put money in Bitcoin? Mm-hmm. You know, so. Hey, that's just how the system works. The yep. people who calculate correctly economically, they have profits and gains. And the people who calculate incorrectly, they have losses. Yep. And the people on the other side of this gulf, because there's no way to avoid the final crack up boom, there's going to be a lot of collateral damage. Just don't be part of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the first rule of panic is to do it first. Mm-hmm. You know, be, be, the, Andreas actually talked about this when I brought up proof of keys. He's like, you know, I'm actually worried that, that it might actually be successful and that people might actually withdraw all their Bitcoins. And then we might actually have failures of Bitcoin companies because, you know, they don't have the Bitcoins that, that they owe everybody. And I'm like, what's wrong with that? I mean, yeah. let's mark to market all of these losses. Mm-hmm. Why, why are we extending and pretending? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I want to know who's got what and who owns what. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know what I own, you know, because yeah. it's in my hot little hand. Mm-hmm. You know, prove the keys. Like, let's prove who's actually got the assets and got and and, and have the value. Mm-hmm. You know, so and and describe and, what proof of keys is for those that don't know. Yeah, so proof of keys, proofofkeys dot com. Uh, it's an annual celebration, January third every year. Everybody withdraws all of their Bitcoin and crypto from any third party. Mm-hmm. Just prove the keys. Mm-hmm. You're going to learn something because yep. they're either yeah. going to send it to you or mm-hmm. they're not. Mm-hmm. And if they don't send it to you, guess what? You just learned something. Yep. You learn that y- you you thought you had a Bitcoin, but mm-hmm. you couldn't actually get it in your hot little hand. Mm-hmm. And you know, last year we we had a we had a casualty, Quadriga CX. Mm-hmm. 
announced proof of keys. A week later, he met with his attorney to set up a will. A week after that, he died in India. Mm-hmm. You know, a couple couple weeks later, proof of keys. A couple weeks after that, Quadriga CX goes into bankruptcy, and we have a whole bunch of people waiting in line, thinking that they might get ten cents on the dollar if that if, or if, Mount if Gox. Lucky, <laughs> right? So, like, you know, but the moral implications, you know, it's it's not. The, the people who have the assets at these institutions, mm-hmm. there's no moral wrongdoing on their part saying, give it to me. Mm-hmm. The, the moral wrongdoing is on the person who was engaged in the fraud mm-hmm. you know, and said that, oh, we, we've got 10 Bitcoins when really we only have eight. Yeah, for sure. Well, and, and look, you uh, obviously have been one of the earliest investors in Bitcoin. You've uh, been one of the most um, convicted investors, right? Uh, and I think you've publicly stated that you're continuing to still acquire Bitcoin today, right? This oh, isn't yeah. a thing where you made an early investment and you know, cross your fingers, hope it works out, and go do other things. Like you are still actively buying uh, derivatives. You're you're acquiring Bitcoin, etc. Maybe talk a little bit about your philosophy, just as uh, as someone who was early, but but still is very active. And convicted. Yeah, so I mean, at hot or last resort, and like, what else are you going to buy? I mean, I don't want, I don't want to buy real estate. I mean, they, buy real estate in Chicago, like they're just going to jack up your property taxes. Mm-hmm. Guess what? There's there's no account fee for holding Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Negative interest rates in Europe. Negative interest rates on your bank account. Don't get that on Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Uh, property taxes going up. Don't get that on Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. You know, company deciding not to pay a dividend, not not getting cash flow. Don't have that with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's mm-hmm. safe, liquid, you know. And if Plan B is right, it's like going to the freaking moon sooner than we might have thought. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then you know, trading the derivatives on it, you know, Bitcoin's highly volatile. And so, if you're going to be a hodler of last resort and you're going to be exposed to all this volatility, why not get paid for it? Mm-hmm. You know, so like I love selling these calls on Ledger X, and then I turn around and I take the premium from the calls and I sell puts. Mm-hmm. And I'm outside of these different mayor multiple bands, and I'm like, and I'm, and I, I actually have a pretty complex algorithm that like spits out, you know, all this stuff using Plan Bs, and I'm tinkering on it mm-hmm. and stuff too, but. You know, at the end of the day, like I'm able to either acquire a lot more USD or I end up acquiring Bitcoin because I sold the puts yep. with the premium. And so, you know, this becomes a way, you know, and I'm going to be exposed to the to the volatility anyways. Mm-hmm. And, and a good example of this is uh, so when Bitcoin ran uh, a few months ago to 13,800, mm-hmm. about 13,000, I sold a bunch of August and September 20 and 25k calls. And so I said it again. I sold yep. 20 and 25k calls okay. August and September. Okay. Right when Bitcoin ran to 13k. Uh-huh. Like back in July. Mhm. So the price went up so so you had the delta and then you had the increase in the volatility and so I got a lot more on the premium. So I got anywhere from 300 to 600 dollars premium mm-hmm. per Bitcoin mm-hmm. with 20k strikes, mm-hmm. like only two months out. Mm-hmm. And then you know Bitcoin, the price came back down, uh, you know, to 10 grand or whatever. The volatility retreated. I closed. I either closed or had expire worthless all those calls that I sold, mm-hmm. and I turned around and written puts. Mm-hmm. Like nine nine k and ten k puts mm-hmm. with Bitcoin, mm-hmm. so yeah, you're just playing. You're playing a game where once you understand the market and kind of the volatility, you're able to play both sides of it and do it in a pretty risk adjusted way. Yeah, and and what's really cool about it is there's plenty of opportunity here because some people are measuring their portfolio in USD, mm-hmm. some people are measuring their portfolio in Bitcoin, and some people are kind of measuring it in both. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if you if you sell the covered call at thirteen k. Your, your, your collateral has to get locked up. So it's at risk, right? Mm-hmm. So it goes from 13K to 10K. Mm-hmm. It, the collateral goes down 3,000 US and I only got $500 of premium for mm-hmm. accepting that type mm-hmm. of downside volatility, right? Mm-hmm. But as a, as a Bitcoin hodler, I'm just fine with it because I just want to hodl my Bitcoin and not pay taxes on yep. a recognition event. So also these long out of the money calls, which if they get exercised, they're going to exercise it like a 26 plus mayor multiple. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of fine selling at that higher mayor multiple anyways, mm-hmm. and then turning around and selling puts all the way down on the USD in order to reacquire the Bitcoin hodl stack. Mm-hmm. Got it. Um, any crazy stories from the early days of Bitcoin? 
Oh man, there's like a unlimited number of those things. How about, uh, this was a fun one. So I was helping Charlie Shrim and Eric Voorhees plan the first Bitcoin conference in San Jose in 2013. Mm-hmm. And I paid for a bunch of uh, expenses and stuff. And so they, they were supposed to reimburse me. And if you ever try to get Charlie Shrim to send you Bitcoin, it takes a little while. <laughs> he, he understands cash is king, right? So eventually, uh, two or three weeks later, he finally sent the Bitcoins to me. Uh, but I still have those Bitcoins. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I mean, those things are like, they're, they're, they're a couple million bucks. You know, yeah. we're just talking like de minimis incidental stuff at the time. A yeah. few thousand dollars of expenses, you yeah. know. So, I mean, it's just crazy, like, how much fun it is, too, you know. Because like that first conference, been to like all the Latin American Bitcoin conferences, uh, investments, you know, helped seed fund Kraken. But... I mean, I, I looked at BitInstant, mm-hmm. you know, Charlie Shrimp's thing, passed on that. Mm-hmm. Good, good call <laughs> Yeah, in, in the end. Yeah, yeah. I was like, Charlie, you're either incompetent with your financials or you're engaged in fraud. Either way, I can't invest in you. <laughs> and I don't want to pay for your criminal defense attorney, <laughs> which is exactly what ended up happening, right? Uh, there is another, another exchange I looked at before Kraken. Uh, interviewing the CTO who didn't, I mean, all the all the hacker type questions just went right over his head. Mm-hmm. So passed on that one. They eventually brought on as their chief compliance officer, one of the rogue Silk Road agents mm-hmm. they, that's now in jail. So wow. dodged a bullet there. Yep. You know, so it's, you know, didn't just get lucky. You know, you have to use some, use some brain power in this area. But it's, it's been so much fun too, because I mean, we're, we're changing the world. I mean, this is monetary sovereignty mm-hmm. that we're bringing mm-hmm. to people. And, and, Property rights is really what lifts us out of poverty. Mm-hmm. So if, if you want to help change the world and really help people live a better life and all that stuff, I mean, you're, you're not going to find a more powerful tool, in my opinion, than Bitcoin to do that. And so then it's just how do you get involved with it? I, I continue to say that Bitcoin's uh, rise to prominence and success would likely do more for uh um, the world in terms of equality and, and um, kind of positive impact than all uh, all philanthropy uh, combined simply because it changes the structural issues that are keeping 50 plus percent of the world's population um, enslaved to debt, enslaved to inflation, etc. Yeah, you have you have property rights coupled with uh, eliminating or, or getting rid of this economic censorship that's mm-hmm. happened. You know, and that that's the real problem we've got. You know, we entrepreneurs and people in the developing countries and even in the developing in, in the developed countries, they can't allocate capital mm-hmm. in in a wise way because there's been so much economic censorship by the institution of the state. And Bitcoin helps just slice through all that. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, I mean you like you're doing good for the world, you're doing good for yourself. You know, take care of yourself. Uh, Bitcoin helps you do that. Focus on your health, your wealth, your relationships your experiences in life Mm -hmm. like live a good a good life you know bitcoin helps change a lot of that too because you you, you're shifting your time preference Mm -hmm. and when when a lot of individuals start shifting that the culture begins to change Mm -hmm. and then you know if we if we have a much longer time preference in our culture you know we're going to be tackling a lot of issues like pollution and deforestation and mm-hmm. like all of these things that really should should be solved with property rights. Yeah. Uh, and we'll be able to do that. And guess who's going to have the money? It's going to be people who like had this change in time preference. For sure. What's the one thing that you look at moving forward that would be the biggest, most important inflection point in Bitcoin's adoption or success? I think it's going to be... Uh, a lot of these large asset managers realizing that they just have to own Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And then it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's going to be crazy, like with mm-hmm. Bact and Ledger X and these options and having to hedge it into your portfolio. Because once that starts happening, I mean, we're talking Bitcoin's like, <laughs> crypto's a $200 billion market cap. Like, that's nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we got companies with more cash on their mm-hmm. balance sheet than oh, yeah. Bitcoin's entire market cap. Yep. And there's always enough Bitcoin. It's just a matter of price. Yep. So people are going to have to bid that price up. And how do you, how do you bid the price up? How, how do you get how do you get hardware as a last resort to be selling Bitcoin? Mm-hmm. And so this is a one by one revolution in terms of claiming our monetary sovereignty, mm-hmm. and and people get to choose it. You know, this isn't coercive in any way. So mm-hmm. if you haven't chosen it, you have no one to blame but yourself. Mm-hmm. I completely agree. Uh, what's the one thing that you think people misunderstand about Bitcoin that you want to correct? I think they just understand the economics. They do not understand. No, everybody's Keynesian. Nobody understands Austrian economics. 
those that do, you know, might have a cursory uh, skin deep water water skiing uh, understanding of it, like Peter Schiff, mm-hmm. and then be be warping it to serve their own self interest instead of. Uh, the actual science of the economics. It's just a bunch of political dogmatists. And so, I mean, if people really understood what the soundest, hardest money that the, 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 the human race has invented really means in terms of, of its implications, I think, you know, we'd have a radically different world and change would be happening so much faster. And it's already happening extremely fast. I couldn't agree more. Um, last question for you. What's the most important book you've ever read? Oh man, that's a great one. Uh, well, it, it really depends on the topic, you know. If, if you just look back at your life and you say the most important book on my life that I've read is, oh, I mean, I really like Heaven and Hell by Emanuel Swedenborg. Mm-hmm. You know, he was. I, I ran into him because he he was, I mean, massive polymath came up with the atomic atomic theory the grandfather of psychoanalysis, uh, and he was master of the mines, so he was in charge of the mining industry in Sweden. He was in the royal court, and he uh, took took time away from uh, some, of, some of his work in order to help fix Sweden's monetary system. Mm-hmm. And so I, sh- I think that just helps us understand just how important, uh, how important the money really is in fixing that. You know, because all the great polymaths have been uh, have thought about this. Mm-hmm. Isaac Newton, Goethe, Swedenborg, mm-hmm. Copernicus, uh, Jefferson. You know, a lot of these people. And so, you know, I think I think that's that's probably one of the books because, you know, when you start shifting time preference, you know, ultimately you're gonna you're gonna get to the question of like, well, what happens after you die? Yeah, absolutely. And and that's where you run into Swedenborg. And so, you know, it's interesting that he took time off from that much more important thing because running around collecting Mario coins, like, what difference is that going to make? Yeah, you know, absolutely. But, but he, he actually took time away from, from that much more important work to focus on helping fix uh, the Swedish monetary system and all the implications that would have for society. And he wrote it out in a paper. Um, and so, you know, I... I, I find, you know, in terms of most important books, I mean, there's so many out there. There's human action. There's money, theory, and state. There's what government's done to our money. Uh, you got religious texts, like, across the board that help you, like, live a better life. You've got um, Bitcoin Standard. Um, I mean, there, there are just so many good books that are attached, like, if you're yep. uh, working on relationships. you got flow if you're trying to find happiness in life. Uh, like how, what are the rules or principles for that? I mean, there's so many like phenomenal books uh, that people can read, and you are kind of the sum total of the ideas that you put into that like uh, gray matter in between the, your ears. The, the food diet and the knowledge diet are both important. What uh, where can people find you on the internet? Yeah, so at Trace Mayer on Twitter, uh, not too active, but but I I stir stuff up every now and then. <laughs> Uh, and then Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, so www.bitcoin.kn. And thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for doing this. You're a legend. Hey, everyone. Pop here. If you like this episode of Off the Chain and want to help us take crypto to the top of the Apple, Spotify, and other podcast charts, please do us a favor and rate, review, and subscribe. To review, simply go to the Off the Chain homepage, scroll down until you see the five blank stars. Taking 15 seconds to fill those stars in and leave a quick review goes a long way in helping us take the entire crypto ecosystem to the top of the charts. I appreciate you listening and see you next time on Off the Chain.